everybody, welcome to Inside Quest. We are the flow trigger for your mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can help you Superman your brain. And if you're looking to fly your intellect into Tomorrowland, there is no better guest than the man joining us today. He's an award-winning journalist and the foremost expert in the science of ultimate human performance, a passion he developed after rising victorious from a brutal battle with Lyme disease. An amateur extreme athlete who has broken over 80 bones, his work transcends idle philosophy and has the breathless quality of a man riding from the front line. His words and insights race off the page with an urgency that reveals a mind that manages to perpetually operate in a higher gear. Co-conspirator with Peter Diamandis in the quest to future-proof all of mankind, his ideology has made even global thinkers stop and take note. Former President Bill Clinton called his book bold, The Future is Better Than You Think, a visionary roadmap for change. A deeply passionate man who continues to thoughtfully explore a wide range of topics. His book, A Small Furry Prayer, Dog Rescue and the Meaning of Life, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And his most recent work, Tomorrowland, is one of the most well-researched and revelatory explorations of the stranger-than-fiction world of science fact that we are now living in. Overall, his work has been translated into more than 40 languages and has appeared in over 80 publications worldwide, including the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Forbes, Wired, in time. And, as if that wasn't already enough, he founded both the Flow Genome Project, dedicated to advancing the scientific understanding of optimized human performance, and a nonprofit dog sanctuary called Rancho de Chihuahua, dedicated to providing hospice care and other services to small dogs. Please help me in welcoming the author of the mega hit Rise of Superman, the multiple New York Times bestselling author, and the first person in history to land a book on the national bestseller lists in the sports, science, and business categories simultaneously, Stephen Kotler. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. So as a man who focuses so deeply and profoundly on getting to the deep now, what made you write a book called Tomorrowland? My beat as a journalist, it, it actually came out, of a, uh, it came out of a conversation with Peter Diamandis, um, which is the story that opens the book. Uh, we were, it was the first time I met Peter. We were in San Francisco. The X Prize wasn't you know, it was just a brand new idea. It didn't really exist. He hadn't, I think he had just launched it, just announced it. Uh, and we got together, we were at a diner in, in Chinatown. And <clears throat> the diner was kind of empty where we were sitting and it was really crowded over there. There were a lot of people in the back. Peter's back was kind of to everybody. And Peter just, like, he was telling about how we're going to take down NASA, we're going to go into space. And he's shouting. And <laughs> everybody in the diner is looking and like, who is this madman talking right. about how we're going into space? And it just so happens that mm -hmm. I was covering Craig Breedlove when he was trying to drive a car through the sound barrier, and all the engineers I met along the way kept saying, hey, you know, it's harder to drive a car through the sound barrier than it is to go into space. So I just had a month of people telling me doing this thing that I saw done uh, is harder than going into outer space. So everybody else thought Peter was crazy, and I was like, well, I don't think he's crazy at all. But I walked out of the diner, and I was like, crap, if private space flight, you know, one of these great science fiction ideas is possible, the hell else is possible, right? So I made a long list of all these science fiction ideas, things that had fascinated me, things that were in the 20th century, and I just started tracking them. And so for, as I was, as I was a journalist for a very long time, still am a little bit. Um, <laughs> just a little. Just a little. Um, that was one of my beats. So I, which, which was an astounding beat to have because I got mm -hmm. to be in the room a bunch of times when history happened and when science fiction turned into science fact. And it was just sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about physical performance or intellectual performance. I'm fascinated with what do we call the impossible and why is it impossible? And I don't believe it's impossible and let's make it possible right. kind of transitions. So I'm really, anybody who's kind of envisioning the future and envisioning science fiction technology and saying, hey, we can make this real um, is really interesting to me. A lot of those people are crazy, by the way, but super, super interesting. It, it's, um, it's fascinating. So obviously, I and I'm sure countless other people in this room have read The Rise of Superman and all the things you're talking about with Flo and I was trying to find that thematic through line if there was one, um, which obviously it doesn't necessarily have to be, but hearing you say that um, part of it is just people that are pushing the limits, whether it's pushing the limits um, intellectually or whether they're trying to prove that something is, is impossible, there's, um, there's a driver there that I think is, is pretty common because I, 
also find myself absolutely fascinated by the future, but I'm not entirely sure why I'm so driven by that. What are you hoping that people take away from Tomorrowland? That's an interesting question. Um, if you talk to science fiction writers, science fiction writers have sort of started to run out of ideas in a, in a weird way because the future is happening right. so fast. I very much believe you go where you look. I think almost everything works that way. So you have to be able to see into the future to make it a reality. So one of the things that's interesting to me about Tomorrowland is that you know I'm hoping people will read it, A, to get a better sense of where we are today, mm. imagine a bigger tomorrow. But I also think you know it's really, there's a lot of commonalities among all the, I mean, they're all mavericks. If you go through kind of the history of all the people who invented the future, they're all visionaries. A lot of them are very, very eccentric, and you have to be mm -hmm. to say, okay, this thing doesn't exist in the world, and I'm, I'm going to dream it up, and I'm going to bring it bring it into play. This is, nor a lot of the books that are written in futurism books are written actually about the future. This is a futurist book about mm -hmm. stuff that's already happened, and it's, you know, it seems to be one of the only records of this, of, of the period of time where we went from science fact into science fiction, or vice versa. There's a couple key questions that I want to ask you that I think maybe are going to be a little unusual, but one you fed to me in the title of your book, which is um, Dog Rescue and the Meaning of Life, so we'll have to talk about the meaning of life in a second, but what do you think, uh, in fact, let me back up a little bit. So walk people through an abbreviated version of what you discovered surfing after Lyme disease, which will really set up my next question. So I spent about three years in bed with Lyme disease uh, and I was, I was done. I, was, there, I couldn't walk across the room. I was functional maybe 10% of the time. Cog my cognitive function, if you don't know what Lyme is like, it's sort of like the worst flu you've ever had, crossed with paranoid schizophrenia. Whoa. Um, so yes, I was physically destroyed, but it was my mind that was really going, Lyme is sort of like watching yourself go mad. I was hallucinating, I was dyslexic, I had no short-term memory, I had no long-term memory. The doctors had pulled me off medicine. My stomach lining started bleeding out. Nobody knew if I was ever gonna get any better. Wow. And uh, I was gonna end my life because I was only gonna be a burden to my friends and my family at that point. Like I was functional 40 minutes a day, tops, that was it. And the other, there was a time I was lying on a couch and into this absolute, kind of, I was a dark, dark period. A friend of mine showed up at my doorstep and she said, let's go surfing. And I, I started laughing. I was like, I can't walk the bear. You want to go surfing? And she wouldn't leave and she wouldn't leave and she was badgering me. And finally, after hours, I was like, the hell? Let's go surfing today. I can always kill myself tomorrow. Like, what's the worst <laughs> that could happen, right? Um, and they took me to Sunset Beach and uh, they had to ca basically carry me out to the waves. They grabbed me by the arms and they sort of dragged me out there. And, I was out there 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a wave came and I, muscle memory took over and I spun the board around, paddled once, twice and popped up to my feet and just popped up into a world I didn't even know existed. I you know, felt amazing. First of all, my senses were heightened and I caught four more waves that day and by the fifth wave I was, I was done. I was disassembled. They drove me home. They put me into bed. People had to bring me food for the next 14 days because I couldn't even walk to my kitchen to make a meal. On the 15th day I went, caught another ride back to the ocean and did it again. In the course of about six to eight months, I went from 10% functional to about 80% functional. And, you know, this raises a number of questions, like number one, what the hell's going on, right? Surfing is not a known cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. On top of that, I'm a science guy. I don't have quasi-mystical experiences. I certainly don't have them while surfing. It was totally flaky, and I was pretty sure, Lyme's only fatal if it gets into your brain. So I was pretty sure that the reason I was having these, even though I was feeling better, I was having these mystical experiences, mm -hmm. was because I was sure the disease was in my brain and it was killing me. Right. So I lit out on a giant quest to figure out what the hell was going on with me. What I'm really trying to figure out, so I'd love to hear your definition of what exactly is the nature of human performance. So you've written so eloquently in, um, certainly in Rise of Superman, about how far humans can push themselves and, and the fascinating thesis that you have in Rise of Superman is that you shouldn't see advancements like we see in extreme sports when life and death is on the line. And yet, it's the most rapidly advancing sport. So it hints at something that um, Mark Devine, who was a guest on Inside Quest, Navy SEAL, and he said he has got a concept called 20X. You're capable of 20 times what you think you are. Like, whenever you've been maxed out, totally taxed, and you think I couldn't possibly do any more than that, you've got 20 times more than that that you're capable of. And it, it's uh, an utterly fascinating concept to me, and it seems like some of the things you've experienced and certainly written about hint that there's some truth to that. I think that's true. I, you know, 
I started out covering, chasing professional athletes around mountains. I swear, as, I, as in my early my journalism career. In the beginning, we used to, all the journalists who covered this stuff. We would talk about it. We'd be like, "Oh yeah, this has got to be the top. It just can't go anymore because right. the level of performance is so ridiculous." And it already, it, I mean, even back then, it looked like real magic to be on the mountain with a professional big mountain skier and see what they're actually doing up close it doesn't it doesn't look like sports it right. looks sort of like michael jordan used to look playing basketball where you, you just felt like you were watching somebody defy the laws of physics right that's sort of what this was except at high speeds with mortal consequences <laughs> right um is that all is that all uh so but the, the 10x thing is i certainly we're seeing that in action and adventure sports as a result of how good these athletes have gotten at hacking flow but astro teller who runs google x mm -hmm. at google x their goal is projects that are 10x, right? A right. thousand percent improvement over where we are today. And if you talk to Astro about it, say, you know, how hard is this? He'll tell you, you know, I actually think it's easier to go 10x than it is to go 10% better. He said, you want to improve your product or whatever it is 10%, you're going to put yourself into a smartness contest with everybody else in the world. And mm -hmm. statistically, you'll lose that battle. But to go 10x, to reframe the impossible as possible, to throw out all the existing assumptions and all these technology and that kind of opens it up and his argument is that it may actually be easier to go 10x than it is to go 10 percent and I, th I think on a certain a certain level it's true and certainly everybody I've talked to says yeah I think we've tapped 5 to 10 percent of our actual potential and nobody seems to know what the upper limit is they just know that we're nowhere close to it so you've you've spoken so eloquently already about flow written about it and so you guys please look that up if you haven't already read rise of Superman do yourself a favor um, but that, that I think is one element of it. Are there other elements? Is there a cocktail of behaviors that we can all use in our own life that um, allow us to really push the limits? And so if we take Astro Teller's stance that it would actually be uh, a worse use of my time to try to improve myself 10%, how do I 10X myself? Um, what does that look like? How do you, what do you, you wake up in the morning and what do you do? You know, I, I mean, at a certain level, you're looking for what is a, how do I live a high flow life, right? right? I think one of the simplest things I did to massively just kind of up level my life is I said, okay, I'm going to do only six things, period. I do six things. I do nothing else. And five of them generate flow, and the other one supports the other five um, as, as a kind of a support system. And I don't do anything else outside of that. It's a really easy way to live because I know, always know what I can say no to and what I'm going to say yes to. Right. Um, Passion is one of these words that people mystify a mm. lot. It's got all kinds of crazy meanings to people. The important thing about passion, there's two things. The first is we talk about passion as a flow trigger. And all that means is flow follows focus. So anything that grabs hold of your attention and focuses your attention can help you produce flow. Passion is a fantastic focusing mechanism. That's why passion is so important. We pay more attention to those things we believe in. Right. So we'll trigger flow. The other thing is people don't realize what passion really is on the front end. We see it on the back end. We see Michael Jordan. We're like, oh, that, that's, you know, or LeBron James. Or, you right. know, that's what it looks like. On, no. Passion is just like it's, it's a place where two or three curiosities intersect. One curiosity alone Probably not enough energy there. But if you can find a place where two or three of your own curiosities intersect, well, there's a lot of energy there and you can build there. You can start by making a list of 25 things you're mildly curious about. That's enough to kind of build on and you start there, you end up where LeBron is. It, it, you don't wake up one morning, some, maybe you do, but most people don't wake up one morning and go, oh my God, this is my purpose. I know what it, mm -hmm. it does, doesn't work that way. It's a slow, it's a slow build, and I, you know, I think I think Mark would have told you, you know, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. There's a lot of kind of yeah. fundamental, basic wisdom um, that's more about, you know, follow your curiosities and, you know, don't take your emotions too personally. Well, I was about to go somewhere else, but that certainly caught my attention. So, um, don't take your emotions too personally. What do you mean? I think especially here in America, I mean especially in LA, people love, the, you know, look at me, I'm having an emotion, oh my God, I'm having an emotion right now. Who cares? I mean, seriously, who cares? You're in a bad, don't take them personally. One of the things we learn in flow research is um, a lot of your times your emotions don't exactly mean what you think they mean. Flow requires risk, so you need to 
re change your relationship to fear. Fear stops being the sign of stop, don't go. It becomes the sign of go, right? I want to move forward. The only way you can do that to actually go forward is to not mind the fact that you feel like crap. It doesn't mean the right. fear goes away. Emotions are just indicators of uh, behavior. They're meant to modify behavior, right? That's what they sort of, this function they serve. Mm. And they're supposed to pass very, very quickly. Here, change this way, go in that direction. That's, that's all we're dealing with. They're not meant to, we've got a culture that wants you to look deep inside and examine your emotional. Go right ahead, you can do it, but you're just gonna get stuck in the mud for years on end. High performance requires not minding how you feel and you just keep going. This is so powerful. So my promise to these guys and anybody watching at home is that the show is meant to give you the useful tools you're going to need to go on and do whatever you want in your life. Uh, there's, for me, a few key things to becoming successful in whatever you want to do. And number one in that is the ability to manage your emotions, control your emotions, however you want to think about it. I often uh, sum it up by saying those who self-soothe the best win. Um, but it's actually more like what you're saying and what the, the language that I use and these guys have probably heard me say a million times is don't trust your emotions, right? Mm -hmm. So don't trust your emotions because they don't necessarily move you towards your goals. Now, one thing that I know that you have an incredibly deep understanding of is neurology. So what's going on at an emotional level that creates that feeling? How can people learn to recognize those triggers and then take control of that? Because I, I think part of the problem is that the emotion is so real and they're feeling it, and therefore it feels justified because it, it's, it's present, right? It would be like saying, that chair's not there, and you're like, but I'm sitting on it, motherfucker. Like, what are you talking about? So how- Oh, I didn't know we could swear here. Oh, I'm so <laughs> excited. <laughs> Shit just got real. <laughs> um, yeah, so what's going on neurologically? And, and it would be interesting, because I mean, you started by telling us a story that I was about to kill myself, right? So I, but now you're saying, like, hey, that's I a I wasn't killing state. myself out of depression. I was killing myself out of practicality. Like, I, I was certainly depressed. I wasn't happy. But literally, like, I was just a burden. Mm. Like, if you're functional 40 minutes a day, you can't work. You can't, like, I was just going to be a burden for the rest of my life to my friends and my family. That's why I was suicidal. Obviously, one of the goals of, of kind of mindfulness meditation, right, is to, they talk about getting into the gap. Have you heard that phrase? People talk about that you've heard? I've, I've heard it from you, okay. but other than that, no. Well, as your emotions come up, there's actually like a millisecond before where, where like you can feel them rising mm. before they've actually hit you. And you can get into that space and you can, you can make decisions in there about how you're going to feel. My wife loves to remind me. Um, Whenever, whenever I'm in a bad mood, she's always like, the, n nobody I know like, has chosen their life more than you. Like, so like, whatever you're pissed about, you chose this. This is, <laughs> like, this is you, you built this, you did this, like, get over it. And I, she's absolutely right with that. And I totally agree with you. I think so much of success on any level is emotional management. You absolutely have to do it. And you can, in flow hacking, it's critical because a lot of your emotions in flow hacking, for example, uh, uh, the first stage of a flow state before you're actually in this state is it's a struggle phase, it's a loading phase. You're loading and then you're overloading the brain with information. It's skill acquisition. So this is for an athlete, it's like to swing a bat at a ball. For a writer, it's I'm doing my research, I'm doing whatever. It's called struggle for a reason. You are you have a working memory, which is all the kind of things you contents of consciousness that you can hold on to at once. It's very limited. Most of us can think about four things at once and then you're sort of tapped out. Right. So in this struggle phase, you are going to overload your brain with information. It's going to be, by definition, be extremely frustrating. Most people look at frustration and go, oh, this is a sign I'm doing something wrong, I've gotta stop, I gotta back off. But if you're interested in flow hacking, producing more flow in your life, no, actually frustration is a sign that you're moving in the exact perfect direction and you're moving where you need to go. So I think what we've noticed with a lot of things with ultimate performance, with fear, with frustration, is a lot of times your emotions actually mean the exact opposite of what we think they mean. They still feel crappy. It doesn't mean frustration is gonna feel any better. It still feels horrible, right? But you don't react to it that way. And over time, you know, it settles down, you become less reactive. It's the same thing, you know, what meditation does, what any kind of mindfulness practice does. Um, and I, if, if you're looking for one at home, we at the Flow Genome Project like um, box breathing. It's what the Navy SEALs use. Hell yeah. um, and it's, uh, it's fairly easy to learn. 
it really occupies, it's a little complicated, so it occupies a lot of space in your brain, so it makes meditation a hell of a lot easier, especially if you're somebody like myself who can't stand to meditate. I love this. So how can these guys practice getting in the gap? It does seem like um, meditation is a very, very, very useful way. You wanna down-regulate the nervous system. Mm -hmm. You wanna calm your amygdala down. Your amygdala is your danger detector, right? Your brain takes in about, there's an argument these numbers vary, so don't quote me on this number, sure. but people think that we take in about 400 billion inputs a second. So that's what your senses are taking. And by the way, consciousness, what is actually pre processing, it's 120 bits. So 400 billion to 120 bits. And just to put that in perspective, if you're listening to me talk, that's taking up 60 bits of consciousness. So if you listen to two people talk at once, that's it, you're tapped out. <laughs> so, and 400 billion bits are coming in per second. So 99.99% .99 of everything that's going on, you're missing. So the idea that your interpretation of reality is accurate, right. get, get over that right away, right? We don't, nobody lives in the real world. We live in our own very, very customized 120 bit at a time version of reality. And one way to kind of do this is tilt the 120 bits that are coming and change it. Most of those 120 bits, by the way, are dominated by things that we're scared of. That's just the way the brain is it's wired. The first stop all this information makes is the amygdala. It's your danger detector, right? right? So there are different numbers, but you know, people like to say that like for every one positive thought that gets in, you've already taken in 10 negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's just literally the, the, the brain working naturally, trying to protect you, trying to keep you safe. Um, but that's what you're up against on a certain level. It is so powerful to me, that concept of getting in the gap. And I think practicing it is critical. I will say though, that from a practice perspective, I don't, here, maybe we use meditation differently. I do box breathing as well. Totally agree with you. There's something about the way that it, there's so many pieces to it that you're not able to drift right. and wander yeah, in exactly. a way that I had typically before well, that. It, the other thing is the side of the box where you exhale all the air from your lungs and you hold your breath, that automatically triggers the fight or flight response. You're gonna panic, it's automatic, right? You have four minutes of air to draw on, really, but your brain goes, holy crap, there's no air in my lungs, panic! By focusing through that side, you're down-regulating the amygdala. You're essentially training right. yourself to get into that gap. Where the gap is the most interesting in my experience is you can do it with pain too. You can do it with physical pain. I've done it where I've gotten really injured and the second before, the, there's a second too. You get really injured and there's a gap before that pain hits and you can't get rid of the pain completely. But I've, even with broken bones, I've gotten in there and been like, okay, this doesn't have to be crippling. And I, you know, that was sort of like bad situations. Do you where use a visualization technique at that point? Like you see in your head, the pain is large and you slowly start making it small. How do you? No, do you, will that help? It, so it's interesting. Uh, we have, actually have a, a guest coming up on the show. His name is Norman Doidge. Um, he's an MD, wrote a book called um, The Brain That Changes Itself. Mm -hmm. And he has a new book called uh, The Way the Brain Heals. Um, and he, he goes into um, talking about some of the strategies that you can use for pain management. And he followed this doctor who um, had a technique because there's a couple parts of the brain that um, process pain and visual stimuli they, the same place oh, does the same thing. So as pain is happening, you basically, and, and he was dealing with chronic pain, but as the pain is happening, if you force your brain to process visual imagery, then it actually, it's it's much like. Um, oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know It's just know taking that. up the space, right? So you amazing. can't listen to two people talking at the same mm -hmm. time and something else. The brain can't listen to the pain and focus on this image that you're trying to think of in your head. So. The image that the case study that he was talking about used was he had seen MRI scans of his brain when the pain was just a light. And he would imagine that scan and he would try to dim the lights of the areas uh, in the fMRI that were showing the pain trigger. And according to Dr. Deutsch, what's really happening is he's visualizing something, anything, and it stops his brain from being able to process the pain and then over time he's just rewiring it. Um, and all of that stuff I just find utterly fascinating. Uh, it goes into hacking, right? So mm -hmm. whether it's flow hacking or hacking your emotions, for me, it's understanding what's going on like at a deep biological level. And something you guys will find as you research, Stephen is 
He has a deep understanding of neurology. Like I will put him against some of the foremost experts in the field, your ability to talk about neurotransmitters and just, just the, the raw way that the brain processes data and works um, is, is utterly fascinating. And I'm guessing that's not accidental. I'm guessing that some of your ability to construct your own life, as your wife said, um, has to do with your understanding of this squishy bit between your ears. I, it all, all of it, a lot of it. I'm a, I'm a mechanism guy. I, I wanna know how something works, right? And a lot of this, by the way, was learned the hard way. <laughs> so um, I will tell you something that I have never actually said out loud anywhere, and it absolutely saved my life. So I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and most of my friends uh, ended up uh, going to treatment, uh, becoming, you know, they were alcoholics, they were drug addicts, they went to treatment, they ended up in AA. I was the guy whose job it was to talk to the cops. So I usually stayed sober, because um, I would have to talk to the cops to get, keep everybody out of jail, basically. But I ended up tagging along and spending almost three years going to AA meetings, open meetings wow. and, and whatnot, from the time I was 18 to the time I was 21, didn't drink, didn't do, do anything. And why I kept going back is I had no emotional control. And what I learned at, at, at AA, what I thought it was fabulous for, besides apparently getting sober, which wasn't my issue, was emotional control. I like I had no emotional control, so that was my first. Literally, I spent three years, wow. in, you know, going to AA meetings regularly, learning how to kind of control my emotions and deal with my emotions. It was fantastic for that. Probably not the intended use. I may be the only person in the entire world who used AA for that reason, but for me, it was incredibly, incredibly useful. And it gave me my first kind of sense of emotional control. And what was it about the protocol that was so useful? So first of all, just like being able to talk about emotions and, mm -hmm. oh, we have these feelings. And, but it was a lot of people whose their emotions and not being able to control their emotions is usually what led them to drugs and alcohol. So they had to learn emotional management, other ways to process this stuff. So that's what was useful to me. It was all the, all the kind of wisdom and tools. Well, it's... Um that's that's really fascinating. It's interesting that you're able to, I guess it wasn't technically talk therapy, but to to use the openness to start to get a grip on it. Was it, it allowed you, you have a very analytical mind, obviously. Was it, it allowed you to start analyzing it? It allowed more? me to start analyzing it. And when I coupled that to kind of the neurobiology, which is the mechanism, where do these things go? Because once if you, if, if you can understand how they work in the brain, you can understand interventions, yes. right? Yes. You can, it works this way, okay, we can fuck with this and we're gonna get that right. Like yes. then it starts getting really, really, really easy. And I mean, we don't have all the answers at all, sure. but we went from absolute no clue what's going on to, you know, now I can have coherent conversations about it and I can explain to people it makes sense to me and we can understand the mechanism. There's never been a better time to be alive, right? We know more about the brain, it's advancing so quickly so we can figure these things out and we, we're, you know, the hacking that is coming is nothing compared to what's happening, you know, up to this point. It's really gonna, about to get exciting, I think. Yeah, you make that very clear in Tomorrowland, uh, which is just, a. Uh, it is really fun. As somebody who is utterly fascinated by what is not only coming in the future, but is happening now, and if you spend time with Peter Diamandis, as I've had the good fortune to do, maybe not quite as much as you, uh, but just seeing where, the things that we can predict out, right? And what's going to happen. Um, you say that the human, we're no longer human beings, we're human becomings. So. When I think about human performance and I read, oh, this guy is the, one of the foremost experts in, in ultimate human performance, I think there's no way he's gonna live up to the sort of multifaceted way in which I would think of that from fulfillment and happiness to improvement, and you do. And your work encompasses everything from neurology to spirituality, if I can be honest. I mean, you may have different words for it, but um, it, it is, you approach it in a, in a holistic way. And so I carry that forward as I look into the future is the reason I'm excited about the future and the reason that I would consider myself, while mildly cautiously, I'm very optimistic about what's coming, um, is I think it's going to allow us to push ourselves farther than we thought we could. So let's take um, performance. So 
being able to process data faster for me would be amazing, right? So uh, I do a lot of writing, but I'm incredibly slow. So I get there in the end, but oh dear God, it takes a very long time. So if there are things that I could be doing, whether it's just flow hacking, and those are things we can do right now today, or are there things coming in the future that you certainly hint at in your book um, that are gonna be more profound that will allow that to accelerate even more? Well, in flow, we take in more information per second and we process it more quickly and we process it more completely. And processing it more quickly means we are quicker at finding links between ideas, greater pattern recognition, links between closely related ideas, greater lateral thinking, links between disparate ideas, right? And more completely means we use more of our brain. Most of that, not all of it, most of that comes down to two neurochemicals, norepinephrine and dopamine. Um, they're primarily focusing chemicals. They're feel-good drugs, right? They're primary focusing chemicals. But one of the things they do is they tune signal-to-noise ratios, which is you notice more patterns when they are floating through your brain. So right now, for example, too, way too much dopamine, way too much norepinephrine, it, it becomes schizophrenia. You see patterns everywhere. It becomes conspiracy theories and things along those lines. Um, so there seems to be, right now, an upper limit. Like we can jack up your processing considerably with flow, but there seems to be this neurobiological upper limit where you get too much of it and it kind of turns into madness. You start mm. seeing patterns that aren't there, right? One of the things that I think starts to get interesting is we still can't measure. I mean, I can tell you all those things, but we still can't measure dopamine in the brain. Like we don't, we have no idea how to do it. People will tell you, you'll hear every now and again, this product increases dopamine, they're lying to you. They're measuring downstream metabolites. So it's sort of like they're checking blood for dopamine, which is sort of like measuring water quality in California by taking samples in Colorado. It's about roughly the same thing. And we can't, like I can't put a sensor in your brain. We can measure other neurochemicals different ways, but not dopamine. Right. We're gonna solve those problems. Optogenetics, we think we might be able to measure it with light. There's, there's various things. So we're going to get, this is where we are right now. We know if we want to amplify information processing, we should muck around with norepinephrine and dopamine, but there seems to be this upper limit that we can't get past. And, but we're getting better and better and bad at, at it. So we understand the mechanism. We understand how to amplify pattern recognition. Right. We see these limits. The technology is going to, saying the technology is going to be able to push us past that problem in the near future. I don't know if that's coming. It's one of the things that, that are a possibility, but you talked about information processing and that's a very easy way to amplify it. All right, before we run out of time, I wanna talk about hedonic set points and why they matter. That's an interesting question, a great question. So um, back in the 70s, we kind of figured out that people have, we, hedonic set points are emotional set points, Everybody has the same, well, not everybody, but we have emotional set points and they forever bracket experience. And yours are different from mine or different from yours, but it's why, for example, lottery winners, they will experience temporary elation. They'll be really happy for about six months to a year. And then a year later, they feel exactly as they did before they won the lottery. You see the same thing in the opposite direction, amputees, right? You lose an arm, you go through a period of heavy breathing, but end up usually about a year later back in the same spot. We used to think these were locked in and totally permanent. Now we know that there are a couple experiences, chronic unemployment and the death of a child can lower your set point. They will move you farther down and can permanently alter that. Turns out that repeated access to flow states will raise it up on the other end. So you can, we used to think they were totally fixed and they couldn't, you couldn't move them at all. Mm. Now we think, okay, there are these couple of really horrible experiences that can lower your set points, but frequent access to flow seems to be able to raise, raise those set points as well. It's, it's not just flow, it's also um, frequent access to any of the experiences that really profoundly take you out of your head, so so-called mystical experiences or spiritual experiences. Some of the early research on this was actually uh, done by a woman named Willie B. Britton. She's a neuroscientist at Brown, and she got interested in near-death experiences. Not for anything funky, but she was a trauma expert. And the thing about people who've had near-death experiences is they score off the charts on life satisfaction and overall well-being tests. Even and years later, right? Years later, yeah, and she went, what the hell is going on? Like most people who come really close to dying, they get PTSD, right? They don't score off the charts for anything. They get PTSD. Right. These people have a massively atypical response to trauma. Mm. 
interestingly, she then went, she did a sleep study. This is fascinating to me, but we can use that. What time you go into REM sleep is a phenomenal predictor of depressive tendencies. So normal people go into REM about 90 minutes. Depressed people go in at about 60 to 70 minutes. Super happy people go in about 90 to 100 minutes. And we can look, I could do a sleep study, I could look at your brain waves, look at what time you go into REM, and I can tell you with like 98% accuracy whether or not you're gonna become depressed over the next year or not. Like it's that rigorous. And when they looked at people who had a near-death experience, who'd gone through a near-death experience, they went into REM in 110 minutes. They were off the charts. So it was our first indication like, hey, wait a minute, first of all, you can reset your emotional set points. Right. These hedonic set points are movable and something about this particular experience is massively resetting people, people's hedonic set points. And now we're starting to understand a little bit of the neurobiology of that. There's, it's gonna sound really, really strange, but the, there's overlap between the neurobiology of a near-death experience and the neurobiology of a flow state. They're not complete, but it's sort of the same knobs and levers in the brain, roughly. Um, so it does seem like we can reset our hedonic set points using some of these experiences, but it explains why you know, you feel the same emotionally at 10 as you do at 30, as you do at 40. And it's, that's a really, it's one of the things I, you know, as I've gotten older that, you know, constantly shocks me. My life satisfaction, your life satisfaction has gone up immensely as I've gotten older. But my actual, the emotion, that's why I said earlier, your emotions, like, they're locked in. It's some of its nature, some of its nurture. There's nothing I can do about the bandwidth I'm gonna feel other than generate more flow, which will slowly move me up the scale. That's another reason that I don't wanna take my emotions too seriously because they're, they're locked in before I even had a say in the matter. That's so critical that you guys understand that. The one through line, certainly through today's discussion, and I think is very, very present in all of your work, is the things that you can change, the things that you can gain control of. And one of the reasons I'm guessing, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, one of the reasons that you've studied the mechanisms, as you call it, so thoroughly is to give you that greater degree of control. One of the reasons I'm guessing you study human performance is because there's a tacit acknowledgement in that, that this can be improved, it can be changed, you can push the limits. Um, and I know that you guys are here and I know that you guys watching at home, you, you all have one universal goal and that's you've got something in your mind you're trying to achieve and you watch the show because you want the pieces that you need to put together in order to actually accomplish that. And I'm here to tell you what he's been giving you is one of the most critical pieces that you're gonna need, which is one, to understand your own internal workings, the, the neuroscience of it all, the chemistry of it all, what's actually happening to get into the gap, to understand your emotions, to take control of them, to not take them so personally, um, or as I like to think of it, not to trust them so that you can really get hold of them. Now, the, the thing about when I read about the hedonic set points, like that one really freaked me out and it freaked me out in a good and bad way because it made me question like where are mine? Like are they really low? Because I certainly haven't focused on making sure that I'm going into flow as a way to bump it up. But it also made me very happy for people that you know. And there are people in this, in this company, there are people in your family. In fact, think of the person in your family, they're just always fucking miserable, right? And like no matter what happens, they're just, as the Brits say, they're a misery guts. It's like, what is going, like you, you're not experiencing the same thing. Like we're at the same party, but you're not experiencing the same thing I am given the same inputs, it's kind of freaky. And it's so powerful, once you own that that stuff is manipulatable. Once you own that you can make changes in that, once you own that if you learn to get into flow and you push that and push it and work on it, that you can continue to reset even that, even your most how high is high and how low is low. Like that's critical. When you said that being without a job for a prolonged period of time is on the same scale as losing a child, like th that kind of information is so critical because it lets you know what not to trust. Because if you're without a job and you let that be on the same level as losing a child, like that's bonkers, right? That's one of the, and we're all doing it with something in our life where we've allowed it to mean something that just makes no sense. And getting in the gap of that emotion and figuring out what it is that's stopping you from progressing, and nine times out of 10, it's people wind themselves up over things that don't make any sense and they spin off in a wrong direction. 
realizing that it's controllable, that is step one. Well, that's, you know, it, it, I've done a lot of, Jason Silva and I have presented a lot together, and we, we all, one of the things that always comes up when we're, we're doing something together is, both of us are, will be the first people to tell you it's bad up here. Mm. It's like, in general, we do what we do, because on a general, it's bad up here. So I want to turn this off and get absorbed in what I'm doing, because left on its own, bad shit happens up here, right? And I just, not to be trusted, not to, right? <laughs> Give me some distance from it. And that's, you know, on a certain level, you want, you kept saying where and where and where. Some of it is self-preservation, right? Nobody gets into all this stuff if you're not trying to save your own life. You, that's where it comes from on a certain level. Yeah, that's, that's, that really just hit me. So that's, um, that's an important notion, right? The, especially looking at the breadth of your work to think that that's sort of from your perspective, one of the through lines is saving your own life, getting out of your own head. And, I, and I've seen you and Jason together, which is a lot of fun, by the way, and I definitely encourage you guys to check it out, drop them into Google, uh, and you'll get some really fun stuff. And you guys talk about being neurotic and getting out of your own head. Um, and, and, one of the things in my own progression that I've worked really hard on is um, I have what I call an overwatch mechanism. Now that overwatch mechanism is precisely what's allowed me to be successful because I'm aware of my emotions, my pettinesses, my insecurities, all that. I actually have like, as I sort of imagine it, the humongoloid or whatever they call them in my head that, <laughs> humongoloid. You know, that recognizes, okay, you're doing this for this reason, you're afraid of something, whatever. Even though I'm not stopping myself from doing it, I at least recognize the truth of it and I can address it later. And that in being able to recognize it though, it's a double-edged sword. So that allows me freedom from being taken advantage of by my own brain, being hijacked mm -hmm. by my emotions. That actually doesn't happen to me very often. I've been able to identify those and, and build in techniques and tricks and hacks. Um, but what does happen is that voice gets overly critical. And then that voice begins to, over the most minute of things, begins commenting, right? And then it's like, oh man, they shifted their weight to the left, what does that mean? Oh, they glanced away, they're not really paying attention, you know what I mean? And like you build this narrative in your head that might not really be happening. So that concept of, of getting out of your head and finding that tranquility, for me, that's what meditation has become. And when you look at the research on what meditation does to the physical structures of the brain, it's pretty profound. And learning just to reset sort of your background noise, whether you want to call it anxiety or whatever, um, learning to lower that by practicing it. I don't know, it's quite uh, not a hedonic um, state, but learning to lower that background noise, learning to get outside of your own head, those kinds of things can be in incredibly powerful because at least as you step back in, and maybe it only lasts for an hour at first, and then it's a day, right, whatever, uh, how quickly you rebound from some major trauma. But extending that time of emotional calm is, is one of the most powerful things that you could be working on. And I can say pretty confidently that almost universally, everyone is struggling with the same thing. Like you're getting in your own way. There's some emotion that you're not able to reset from. You're obsessing over something, right? That voice in your head is so loud that you're not able to hear anything else. So it's, it's really utterly fascinating for you to draw that through line through what you do. I think it's maybe a little more universal than any of us would think. One, other, one thing that I think is really super interesting, so when you don't take your emotions super personally, like right when you get some distance from, one of the things that I've noticed that'll happen with me is I'll wake up two o'clock in the morning usually, thoughts racing, absolute panic, because if I didn't plug into it during the day, it's gonna come back and find me at night. And it, and it, it like, it, it's really, it, my, it freaks my wife out, because like I get up and for five minutes, I am so, the world is ending, right? <laughs> like it is every, and, but, but five minutes later, I can, like it's totally gone. I just, it's, it's norepinephrine essentially. It's, it's one neurochemical that is sort of waking me up and making me panic. Mm. It's like, you didn't look at this today. We're gonna grab all the attention while you're sleeping. Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I find it really interesting that like, even when you don't take this stuff personally, you know, it's still coming for you because it's still biology. It's just hardwired in. So you have, it's either gonna own you or you're gonna own it. it there's no middle ground here. And with that, Stephen, thank you so much My for pleasure. coming on. That was incredible. <laughs> Guys.
This is somebody that you're really gonna wanna go in on. The books that he has written are absolutely incredible and he meets everything, no matter what he's writing about, whether it's writing about dogs and their relationship to humans, or he's writing about the rise of Superman, or he's writing about the technologies and things that are happening right now. He does it with a humanity that I think is really unparalleled and I think that you will really, really enjoy. He is definitely somebody who looks at the most amazing and surprising things around us and he does it as a human. And that's something that I actually think is pretty rare that when you can always bring yourself to the table and you can hear his voice so clearly in everything that he writes, uh, it's utterly astonishing. So you're gonna wanna go deep, you're gonna wanna read the articles that you can find around, you're gonna wanna watch his talks, his talks are amazing, uh, but he's absolutely incredible. All right, this is a weekly show, guys, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere, we're at Inside Quest. Um, and you can also find us at InsideQuest.com and be sure to check out all of our latest episodes. And for tickets, go to InsideQuest.com and click Get Tickets. All right, guys, thank you so much. Until next week, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.